Yes, I'd like to win, uh, welcome Sandra Locks of Allen and Locks uh, Incorporated. It's the architectural firm that restored the McNaughton residence on Kenwood, and Sandra has been gracious enough to come back and uh, replicate or repeat the program that she gave for the Historical Society uh, during Preservation Week in May of 1999. Thank you. Thank you. The McNaughton residence was built for Lynn McNaughton in 1929. Um, Lynn McNaughton was the vice president of the Cadillac uh, Motor Car Company. The house was designed by George Mason, who was the first registered architect in the state of Michigan. The notable works included uh, the Masonic Temple in Detroit and the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. Uh, the McNaughtons had a daughter, Edith, who uh, married Benson Ford. Benson Ford Sr. and Edith lived in the house in the late 40s, did extensive renovations in 49. Um, the house changed owners a, a few times, and the current owner of the home is Frank Bellacorsa. He bought the home in 1995 and was in the midst of doing extensive renovations to the house himself when a fire occurred. The fire occurred December 17, 1995, in the middle of the night. Because Mr. Valacorsa was in the middle of renovations, there wasn't anyone present in the home, and the fire destroyed most of the main portion of the house. The roof, attic, floor, second floor was destroyed. This photograph was taken a couple days after the fire. They boarded up the lower level windows so people couldn't climb in. I believe you can see at this point that there is no roof visible uh, on the house. If you take a closer look at the corner of the house, you can possibly pick up the charred wood timbers. Again, there's no roof. You look through the window and you see sky beyond. A closer look, this is the main gable of the front facade. You can see the, the damage the fire did to the stonework. It's amazing, actually, that this particular gable was still standing even after the fire. If you look at that same gable from inside, this is what we found on our, our first days visiting the site. The debris in front of this main gable is the roof structure, the attic floor, the second floor framing. It's all just piled on top of each other and it's sitting on the first floor framing which was of concrete construction. The uh, opening that you see in the brick wall on the left side is actually a fireplace on the second floor. We'll find out later that that fireplace was to a room called the French Room. There was a section of attic floor that, that did exist. This photograph was taken from that location. We are looking back uh, towards what we will discover to be the master bedroom and on the second floor and the living room on the first floor. So basically what we were starting with was a colossal mess. But the house still, even with this amount of devastation, had a great amount of detail and hints that would explain and help us understand how to put it back together. This uh, corner of the dining room still had enough of the wood wainscot and the wood casing on the doors that allowed us to uh, document the profile of the wood so we could recreate the trim detail in the dining room in this location. This is a photograph of the living room. Uh, we are facing the window that uh, fronts Kenwood. And Believe it or not, this window frame actually was preserved and is in the house now. Uh, although it looks like it, it received extensive damage, it was um, mostly charred, um, affording some protection from a, second, a portion of the second floor that uh, didn't burn in the fire. And therefore, we just needed to replace portions of the wood frame for this window and uh, reinstall it. This is a section of the living room crown that we um, were actually able to salvage portions of this so we could recreate this. The, the plaster in the building because of the fire and because it had gone through so many freeze-thaw cycles um, between the, the initial fire and when we were actually able to uh, complete documentation and renovate, 
none of the plaster work was able to be salvaged, but we, ab we were able to uh, cut out a three foot section of this crown uh, and save it for several years so we could then create a mold when we were ready to put the plaster work back into the house we were then able to recreate this exact detail. Uh, the kitchen uh, had enough information so we knew where appliances were located, what the wood detailing was like, what the wood trim was like. Um, underneath that degree we understood what the floor material was. Uh, you'll find as, as I go through slides that Mr. Valacorsa had opted to upgrade uh, materials. so. Uh, this particular counter, when we found it, was a quarrying counter. Of course, that wasn't a 1929 item that came with renovation somewhere uh, through the years. And um, the current renovation uses a granite countertop in the, in the kitchen. And this is the boiler room in the basement. It, what you're looking at is actually three feet of water. Uh, no roof, no second floor, uh, no attic. We had uh, extensive water damage in the basement. Again, the fire started in December. Um, we started working on the project in March when I actually was able to get into this room and to field measure it. Uh, this water was frozen. I, I stood on six inches of ice uh, while we field measured this room. There were no working drawings or scaled drawings of the uh, home. The, the only drawings that were made available to us from the beginning were eight and a half by eleven sketches from the real estate agent. Uh, these drawings were not to scale, um, not correct in some locations, uh, but they did give us a general idea of where things were located. So walking through the house, having never been there, these sketches allowed me to understand that we were entering what will become the dining room or what will become the morning room. Um, living room, so on. The second floor uh, sketch was a great help because none of these rooms really existed except for the bathrooms. Uh, the bathroom construction, the floor of the bathrooms uh, was concrete construction on open web steel joists and so the those floors actually remained in place and uh, so on the second floor the only items I was actually sure of being able to field measure in order to document where the bathroom locations. You notice on the upper left corner there's a, a round room and it's labeled the French room. Um, we learned from the real estate agent that Benson Ford, um, as the, he had modified the building in 1990, uh, 1949, brought over from France some curved, carved, uh, paneling that he incorporated into this room and hence it was known as the French room. We also obtained uh, photographs from Christine McNaughton who was the aunt to Lynn Allen who was the daughter of Benson Ford and these became critical in our understanding for the house. Uh, as you can recall the first photograph I showed you after the fire I said you didn't see a roof. Well, this is the amount of roof you actually see from the street. Um, it's, it's actually a very a dominant feature on the house. This photograph is taken of the side entrance and the garage portion of the house. And these were given to us in order to understand um, the, a very complex roof system. This photograph is taken of the rear of the house uh, the gable uh, in this location actually didn't exist when I got to the house that had fallen in. Um, so at first it was difficult to place, but obviously the chimneys could help you and, and it made me realize that uh, a whole section of wall had, had come down. Uh, this also allows you to understand that the roof has some subtle changes. If you follow the ridge line of that gable over, you see it kick up. Um, to pick up a higher ridge line uh, so you know something is, is going on there but I didn't know what um, right away. Uh, the other interesting thing with this photograph is the there's more snow at the eave when you follow the gable down and uh, the reason there's more snow at the eave is because they had flared that portion of the roof it's actually a shallower slope than the main portion of that gable roof and 
uh, that became important to understand because without flaring eave, we didn't get the head clearance inside the building. So studying these photographs in small details like that actually allowed us to, um, to put the building back together. This is a uh, card from Mrs. McNaughton of the uh, exterior patio and uh, a series of windows. And again, this is another one that we couldn't place. Uh, finally realized in 1949, Benson Ford had added an elevator to the exterior of the building. And the elevator was located down the center of, of these uh, three sets of windows. So what you would see today is actually a window, then elevator, and window. It also helped explain why the detailing at these windows was different than detailing at other windows. To understand the history, um, originally when it was built, didn't have an elevator, they needed to modify elements and items in order to include an elevator. We also received photographs from the Struggle family. The Struggle family bought the house in 1976. Um, this is a photograph of the library room. Mary Struggle actually uh, lived a few blocks away and um, was extremely helpful in helping me understand the uh, building. She, would able, she was able to tell me stories um, to, to say that her son would remember hiding behind a wall. That would help me understand uh, where a wall might be placed just simply because it could be positioned in such a way uh, that a small child could fit behind it. This was a photograph of the Struggles' uh, morning room. Uh, if you can remember this, I'll, I'll show you a photograph a little bit later where uh, we don't have any walls in our morning room and, and we have just a small section of this fireplace. The main hall in the first floor corridor, um, again, this wall didn't exist when we arrived um, on the scene. So this photograph is what we used in order to understand the crown moldings, the, the door casings, the carving over the door, locations of light fixtures. Uh, you can see the hardware on the doors. When we uh, sifted through the debris, we salvaged hardware, uh, door handles, and we could match them back to photographs to locate um, actually where they were used. And this is a photograph of the dining room. And You'll see another photograph where, uh, again, the cabinets on either side of this fireplace uh, didn't exist when we came on site. Uh, there wasn't a trace of marble at this particular fireplace, so this was the uh, only information, actually, that allowed us to uh, detail the um, fireplace around with any degree of accuracy as to the original. And of course the French room on the second floor, and this was our only photograph of the curved, carved wood doors that we're told were in each corner of the room. You also see on the left hand side a small portion of the stone fireplace, and that was done in 1949 with the Benson Ford renovation of the home. This is a photograph of the living room fireplace, um, the lighter colored marble or lighter color fire surround is actually a wood so that was uh, totally destroyed and we had no evidence of it uh, within the home when we uh, started working on it. Um, so from this photograph you'll find that we recreated a fireplace with uh, these details but um, Mr. Valacorsa again upgraded and, and you'll find that our, our new fireplace is uh, carved in marble. We were also given a photograph of a fireplace surround that we uh, soon figured out didn't exist. Um, we were told that this was in the house somewhere. And during our investigations and our digging, we never found any traces of uh, this fireplace. When we um, finally understood the house and understood that there were only seven fireplaces, and I uh, narrowed down what each one looked like, we realized that this was probably the fireplace in the living room, or must have been the fireplace in the living room, in 1929. You see the beams on either side of the fireplace, and that condition only occurs in the living room. We were also fortunate to have the 1929 spec 
specification from uh, George Mason for the original construction of the McNaughton residence. Um, however, the specification book was left in the house, so it was also damaged by fire, but uh, the uh, majority of the text was still able to be read. In this particular section of the, spec uh, the, of the specification is called the Schedule of Rooms, and it listed out each room in the house and also listed the materials that were used to construct the house. Now, again, this was from 1929, so it didn't obviously document the 1949 renovation. So we had an understanding of how the house was built in 1929, but also knew that we couldn't use it as a given because it might not be what happened in 49. Uh, I also visited the Burton Historical Library at the Detroit Public Library. Um, Lynn McNaught, or George Mason, um, as the first registered architect in Michigan, um, was sure to be on file. And sure enough, the McNaughton Mansion was um, on file. The, these sketches were actually um, all that existed within this file. The lower level photograph is the uh, view to the side door and the garage. Uh, the photograph that I showed earlier is very similar to this sketch. The um, middle sketch is uh, the front facade, and you can again see the main gable, the entryway, uh, and the very large roof. Um, and it was fairly accurate to the built uh, environment. And the top sketch actually proved to be most valuable to me. This was of the rear of the building, and I didn't have any photographs um, pre-fire that actually showed this view. We had the one photograph where I talked about the, the tapered roof and the gable, and you see the first gable. If you look at the center of that sketch, you actually see a pair of gables. And this was the first um, sketch or, or clue that I had that there was a second gable adjacent to that first. And um, because as I uh, was on the site, there wasn't any sign of that gable. That entire wall had fallen in and and there wasn't any trace that that second gable existed. Our first order then uh, was, we knew immediately we were going to phase the construction, and our first order of, uh, our first task was to put a roof on it and to enclose the building so that the damage from weather and freeze thaw cycles was going to be minimized and that we could salvage as much as possible of the building. So our first step actually was to clean out the building and make it safe to walk around. Again, we had no uh, floor plans or elevations or any documents of the building that were to scale, so we needed to measure um, the building complete. We hired a, a construction crew to come out and remove the debris, but not simply just haul it out, um, but to also sift through it and help us find clues, hardware, light fixtures, um, wood trim, plaster trim, uh, trim, anything that would help us figure out how the building was constructed. Uh, this view is actually towards the morning room. That was the, the photograph of the blue room that you saw earlier. And you can see at the base there were bits and pieces of the marble surround at that fireplace. We salvaged those, not to reuse, but to document the pattern and the uh, profile of the fireplace and was able to recreate that. Uh, we found, as we got into the house, this is the stair that leads to the attic. Uh, the, the crew, if you look around, there is no floor to stand on. It's not something I was going to get to easily. They um, cut it out for me so we could replace and, and replicate the, the new post and rail, chair rail, etc. So slowly but surely, we were able to clean out the building. Uh, the gentleman that is in the center of the floor is now standing on the first floor. Um, when we first entered that building, he would have been on a pile of debris that was you know, 10, 15 feet in the air or high. This is a um, photograph from the dining room looking up actually at a bedroom on the second floor. The uh, glass door on your left hand side leads out to a deck that's over the bay window located in the dining room. Um, this, this room was actually interesting during our uh, 
excavation of, of artifacts because we found about 20 light fixtures in this this particular room, which didn't make any sense. And we would we would find things like that, go back to the owner, and, and he'd say, "Oh yes, you know they were painting, and so they had taken all the light fixtures, stored them in the dining room, and were um, going to replace them and put them back on the walls once the paint was dry." So that explained why we suddenly found a, a slew of light fixtures all in the same place. Uh, this photograph again was taken from the attic looking down. Um, what you see as a platform is actually the uh, a, a bathroom on the second floor. Again, the bathrooms were uh, concrete floor on metal joists, so this gave us an understanding and a location for a bathroom. And above that bathroom you see a sheet of, of metal. That, that gives you a clue that at that location the roof had a very shallow slope and couldn't handle the um, clay tile roofing material, which requires a steep slope um, for it to work properly. So uh, you would remember and recall items like this to know that the way they solved a problem or they solved an issue was in that location to use a shallow pitch. Uh, we were actually rather excited when we finally uh, found our way into this bathroom days into removing debris and they would cut us paths in the new room so we could try to get in there first and uh, to, to see what kind of details we could extract. And um, we thought, oh, look at the great tile from 1929. And I mean, two days later we found a box of the tile in the bathroom and realized that uh, Mr. Valacorsa had renovated this bathroom. So this tile was only about six months old by the time we found it. So we finally um, asked him if he had any documentation for his renovations, and, and he said, oh yes, this, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? So we uh, were able to then look up to see what kind of tile he had bought, uh, countertops he had bought, uh, to understand what was actually a 1995 renovation. This is a photograph of the master bath on the second floor, and uh, although on this particular wall the wood trim has all been burned away, what you find are the scars of that burning on the plaster wall. So we were able to uh, measure and, and document where the wood trim was placed. And um, there was probably a two foot section of wood trim that, that gave us a profile that, that didn't burn completely away and uh, allowed us to recreate the master bath from, from these types of details that we extract from the building. So before they tore this wall away, we were documenting uh, these kinds of things. And this is a photograph of the main stair and really uh, describes um, all that was left of the loop, uh, rail of uh, the stair. And what we were able to uh, document really is, is a location of where the stair started. Uh, again, we started this in, in uh, March in when we first got on site, it was snow covered, and as the snow melted, we found this piece of flooring out in the middle of the backyard, and I documented it, brought it to Mr. Valcorsa, and he said, oh, you know, that pattern was in the French room. So we were able to uh, document this and replicate the floor pattern in the French room. And this was a, a photograph of the uh, fireplace for the French room. Again, it's on the second floor. And if you notice the brick um, archway, you can see that the original fireplace um, that was built in 1929 was located to the left of the new fireplace. What this told me actually was that when they renovated the fireplace, and not only did they reduce the height, but they had moved it over. Um, this undoubtedly was influenced by the French paneling, and, and so Although it wasn't understood at the time, it was a, a clue as to how to complete and document that room and what the dimensions are of that room. Because obviously, you can see from this photograph, none of the walls existed. This is a close-up of the fireplace surround in the French room. This is all that existed at the time we uh, were on site. And when I picked up one of those pieces, this whole section just came crumbling down. So we didn't have any um, uh, sections of fireplace for the French room that we could actually use to 
to get an authentic profile from. Uh, during our, our search for artifacts, we found a series of drawings and sketches um, in the kitchen. We unroll them, ravel them, lay them out to dry, um, and that's what you see here. They were documentation of the 1949 renovation, and uh, there weren't floor plans still, um, so I still wasn't sure what was going on with the house, but um, what they did provide were individual sketches of the work going on in 1949, as well as correspondence between the uh, interior design firm that was in New York and uh, Benson Ford. So uh, we had an understanding through that dialogue what kind of renovations occurred in 1949. We were also able to then read uh, the individual sketches of certain items. So this was a sketch for the new fireplace around in the uh, master bedroom. And uh, if you can make out the top, it says Benson Ford at the, the very top corner. Um, it doesn't give you the, all the detail of the fireplace, but it gave us the basic dimensions um, that they were working with. And we could use that in our uh, replication of the fireplace surrounds. Uh, this is a blueprint from that same packet of the French room fireplace. Um, it's not labeled, but by deduction it had to be the French room fireplace. And um, we based our design then on, on this uh, document. And this is a blueprint of the uh, garden out in the back, just outside the living room. And we used this actually to recreate the original garden um, although this was described to me as a gardener's garden, somebody who was very interested in, in a, a, a wide variety of plant materials. Uh, Mr. Valcorso was actually more interested in a, a, a floral garden, so we used a similar pattern and um, uh, texture, but uh, did a, an arrangement of flowering uh, plants. So once the building was in a clean state, and this is what I call a clean state, we were able to go around, photograph each room, label them. By this time I understood where each room was, we numbered them, and, um, and, and did a documentation at this level uh, because the reconstruction is going to require these things to be then taken down uh, in a more complete way. So this was our cleaned up version of the library. This. Um, you know, the contractors who removed the demolition were very careful because you recognize that they left, you know, two to three inches of base for the cabinets that were in the library, and that actually helped me understand the, the cabinetry work that was in that room. Uh, this again is a, a photograph of the main stair or hall. Um, what you're looking at is that front gable, but it's been reconstructed, or it's in the process of being reconstructed. The masonry uh, company has taken that gable down piece by piece, and they took each piece down and laid it down in the front uh, yard. And they would reconstruct, recreate a piece that was too damaged to be reused, and uh, pieces that were not uh, too damaged were able to be reincorporated into the front facade. This is a, a corner of the main hall of the um, first floor, and the significance of this corner, ha there's a wealth of details in, the, in this little piece that was salvaged. Um, there is a um, uh, embedded column located within this section of wall that understands the details and uh, profile in, um, uh, for the main hall section. It also, what is, what is swinging out from the uh, side is a pocket door. Uh, we understood from the 1949 renovations that Benson Ford had um, taken the large hall that went from really one end of the building to the other and um, tried to create it into three smaller halls that you were able to then close off um, one section of the house from another. So this door that is sticking out in the hall has a, a partner door on the other side when they're in the open position would actually close you off from the, the uh, adjacent side of the hall and in the closed position 
would sit in its pocket and look um, like a wood panel. Uh, the photograph of a kitchen in the Queen State. And again, uh, this would give us an idea of the islands, the cabinetry work. Um, what was interesting to me is that it seemed to be missing an oven. So again, we, we didn't um, get all our information from the home. I had to interview people and actually ask where the oven was located because uh, they were replacing it. It wasn't here. It couldn't be found. So um, to piece the, the kitchen back together, there wasn't a refrigerator. Uh, those types of appliances were uh, located really through discussion with uh, owners and people who had worked in the home. And even the master bedroom, clearly we were looking at a wall that doesn't exist, but I was trying to make a record of everything um, that was present before we were going to take out uh, elements and, and walls and floors. So, um, and sometimes photographs of this actually became very helpful because I would wonder why I didn't take a, a particular dimension and then I would go back out to the field and I'd realize it was because it didn't exist and it was impossible to take. Um, so, th this actually proves to be helpful. Um, and again, this is looking up from the dining room to the uh, closet in the bedroom on the second floor. Um, I find this interesting just because these were my before shots and it's impossible to take this after shot since I can't stand now in the dining room to see the bedroom on the second floor. Uh, again, Mr. Valacorsa was renovating all the bathrooms, but I believe these fixtures um, were probably original to the house, but the tile was all new. Uh, and this is a little bathroom back over the carriage house, which didn't uh, receive a lot of fire damage, but it did receive a lot of smoke damage. And um, one of the more interesting elements to me about this particular this particular photograph is that the room is actually all white but because of the smoke damage everything was black. It took me a while to start to realize that this house one day would have color again because everything was just simply black. And the laundry room in the basement um, again there was no roof, no second floor, there was extensive water damage. Um, the insurance company uh, was, was paying for a lot of this, so they were trying to have us salvage as much as possible. They were hoping that we could reuse this plumbing, and, uh, and we thought, well, okay, you're nuts, but we'll go ahead and turn on the water and see what happens, and it was as if uh, we had turned on a sprinkler system in the basement when we turned on the water, so all of the uh, piping work and electrical was, was totally destroyed within the home. So through that investigation and that uh, measurements and, and looking at all our details, we uh, generated a floor plan. So this is the first floor plan. Um, what also became extremely evident is, is to get into the head of the architect and figure out how they might have approached the design. And one of the things that was evident was the use of axes and, and to provide order for the main portion of the house. So the living room had a uh, axis down the center where the fireplace was located directly across from the window that is facing the front uh, yard. The doors are equally distant to either side of the um, fireplace. There, the morning room and the library are on an axis and designed symmetrically within that room, uh, the same as the dining room with a, an axis you would see from the, uh, the struggle photographs that the, there was a great amount of symmetry in each room. What happened on one side of the fireplace generally happened on the other side of the fireplace. And then of course the large hall down the, the, down the center, which um, you could see going from the drive all the way through to the living room. And if you look, you'll, you can see uh, that hall actually feels like three halls. That was the result of the 1949 renovation where they um, added the doors that separated that hall into three uh, spaces. And we generated a floor plan for the second floor. Um, and again, this was uh, partially through our investigation, partially from uh, discussions with people. Uh, 
where did you stand and what did you see when you were in the master bedroom. And there are um, a couple cabinets in the master bedroom that are actually described three different ways to me. One person swore they were square, one swore they were round, and another swore they were uh, angular. So um, we, we couldn't reproduce everything uh, exactly and, and be confident that we did, but everything was done in the same spirit as the rest of the house. That, I know, uh, occurred and was evident. Um, another interesting thing that we uh, were able to deduce was that there was a certain level of quality in what was considered to be the main part of the house, and then what, we, what you got into what was considered to be the servant's part of the house, although it was still high quality, was of lesser quality than that in the main. Uh, and in the order, um, I was intrigued. I, I believe George Mason actually even lined up the fireplaces in, in terms of providing a, a kind of harmony within the home. So uh, when I drew, I discovered this actually when I drew the house in elevation um, because uh, the two of the fireplaces always line up in each elevation, although there's five, four chimneys, um, in any given elevation you only ever see three. So I said our first order of business was to figure out the structure and how to put a roof back on. And, um, and it was important to load the building back the same way and to try to figure out the original framing system. And there are clues that help us um, figure this out. Uh, this pocket or hole in the masonry wall is actually a beam pocket. So that told me that a beam was perpendicular to this masonry wall and that it was at that given elevation. This is a photograph of the chimney. It's actually the one that is above the French room fireplace. And if you notice the diagonal line, that is the roof flashing. So this was able, I, I was able to determine exactly where the roof hit this particular chimney and at what elevation and what the slope of that roof is. This was the final working drawing for the roof construction. Um, it is an extremely complicated roof. In one of the hardest uh, elements to actually figure out, um, the, the most complicated portion of this roof, or, or the one that had the least number of clues, was actually where to locate the ridge of the, uh, the main portion of the house, um, which is running along the length or the length of that corridor of the house. And there weren't any, any starting points because the, the gable or the hip would start on a flat roof and then it would taper out or it would die into a, a roof at a different elevation. Um, and it, it couldn't easily be located by the clues that I had found out at the site. Now it was critical in order to determine where this ridge line was because every time I tried it in a different location, assuming that the geometry of the roof might uh, help me figure out where it should be located, I would transfer the roof load down to the first floor in a different way. Um, and that is a, not the greatest thing to do because I am going to be building on existing concrete beams and those beams are specifically designed for a location for a column. So if I move a column, I might overstress that beam and it would fail. So it was actually extremely critical to understand the structure in order to avoid having to reinforce uh, concrete beams in the basin. So if you look back at the front facade of this house, uh, and you can follow where the roof line might be, it, it keeps changing and it doesn't really give you a starting point. Um, but an important element uh, it came to me actually driving home. If you look at the far right of this building, there was a gable that you saw in the photograph when I said this was a photograph of the side entry in the garage. And, um, but you can tell in this photograph that it's, it's missing, it's not there. If I had that gable, I would know where the center point of that roof was. The gable that I'm talking about is the one seen in this photograph. This is our, our, com our reconstruction of that gable and the location of um, that ridge. And what is significant here is that vent. There is a, a 
basically a six inch wide vent um, that is on center of that ridge. Now the gable was missing, but it dawned on me on, on my way home that perhaps some of that vent still existed. I actually drove back out, climbed back up there, and it turned out that there was one inch uh, high of that vent left. But that one inch, that little impression in the stucco wall, actually told me exactly where that ridge line was. So we were able to locate that ridge um, and proceed with confidence that the structure that we were putting back actually was um, designed as, as it was in 1929. So we started reconstruction. And at this photograph, you see um, the, the wood-framed Tudor wall that you saw at the front um, facade of the building is now down because all of that wood was, was too damaged to reuse. Um, and the stone is being reconstructed. Beams are being replaced. This photograph is, is of the shoring around the central fireplace. This is the morning room fireplace and the French room fireplace. You see the French room fireplace is now offset because um, it had been moved over in the 1949 reconstruction. Uh, this was actually a freestanding chimney. Um, so in order to uh, fix or replace the brick, they had to scoop out one side or take out the brick from one side, replace it, go to the other side, um, take out a portion of the brick, replace it, and they had to uh, inch their way up to the top until they were able to reconstruct the whole, the whole chimney. And this photograph starts to show you the reconstruction. So we have a new attic floor, it is the wood framing you see. You're looking through open web steel joists, um, which again were put in, in the same locations as the bathrooms. That, that uh, construction was recreated. We used floorboards in the attic, um, so that was done uh, to, this, to the 1929 specification. And here you see a, a view of the rear of the house where we're reconstructing a gable, um, uh, different portions of the roof, and tying it into existing walls that we were able to salvage. Uh, this is a photograph of the wood framing that is over the carriage house. This wasn't damaged by fire so much as um, completely uh, smoke filled and so uh, we reused or we kept this wood however um, it, it was going to retain the smoke smell so we coated it in order to um, try to uh, dissipate that smell. And the masonry reconstruction was ongoing. This is the bay off the dining room and again each piece was taken off, laid down it was reconstructed if it was too damaged to be reused and then put back. The masonry reconstruction uh, continued through the winter, so we enclosed the area of construction with um, this queen had temporary heat and they, they were reconstructing bay windows uh, through the winter. This is the bay window in the living room and the master bedroom. Some of those stone pieces uh, individually weighed 300 pounds. So this was the roof in its uh, uh, reconstructed state and as they're working through. A photograph taken from the top of our roof looking back. Um, the roof tile was um, clay tile from a company called Ludovici. It was stamped on the back of each of the clay tiles. And uh, there was a section of roof where the, the clay tile survived the fire. That was the portion that was over the um, the carriage house. Uh, there is always a firewall that separates a garage uh, from the rest of the house, which is why uh, it survived the fire. And um, it's an interesting point in my mind uh, in terms of doing preservation work and reconstruction. We um, put in our bid to, uh, as an alternate, that they, they could reuse or salvage the existing tile or they could buy new. And it was actually cheaper to take the tile off the roof, clean it, and, and reinstall it than it was to um, buy new tile. That saved the client about $30,000 than, than purchasing all new tile for the uh, entire structure. Now, it did leave us uh, an issue. In 1929, when they, when they made this tile, they used coal to fire the clay, and um, that gave it a blackened color. 
and uh, they didn't do that. They do, do not use that process today. So uh, we needed to figure out a way to create the same tile but um, and give it the same uh, look. So we actually had them take the clay tile and add what they called carbon black, which was to make it look uh, dirty, basically, and match the existing tile that we were reusing. But it, it gave it its uh, old world look and a, a quality or a look of 1929. Right around this time, I had had several conversations with um, a decorator for uh, Cecil Fielder. Cecil Fielder owned the house prior to uh, Mr. Valcourt. So, uh, Cecil Fielder had done extensive decoration and renovations throughout the house, and he was using a, uh, an interior designer that was in Texas. And I had had several calls to her to see if there were any uh, documents, original or, or not, to uh, this uh, pre-fire condition because that would have given me all sorts of information. However, she said she had nothing, but we had already built the roof and we were um, uh, completed with our phase one construction really when I finally got these in the mail. And this was a schematic design by George Mason of the first floor. and. Uh, it, it really wouldn't have helped uh, a tremendous amount because we, there are significant changes, but um, it does tell you things that we, we came or concluded on our own. You can tell in this photograph actually how wide that corridor is. You can see that it feels more like one large corridor and not three separate corridors. So you can see the change from 1929 to 1949. So actually the, the benefit I received from receiving these drawings was a confirmation of what we had already discovered and learned. And this is a photograph or the schematic design for the second floor um, where again the rooms were uh, ha uh, more chopped up if you will and uh, the 49 renovations uh, started to clean things out. You can also tell in this particular design the French room didn't exist, that curved car paneling wasn't here. The fireplace was centered in the room. Um, it was directly on the opposite side. The fireplace that was in that bedroom uh, was closed up and didn't exist um, at the time of our renovation. So this photograph it shows the greatest amount of extent of reconstruction of the front facade. The front, ma the main gable is down all the way to the low windows that um, are below the the main gable. The um, the Tudor framing is gone, the whole front side on the living room side is now down and now being reconstructed. This also then shows you what was salvaged. Any stone you see in this picture at this point is original stone to the house, to the 1929 version. And then this was the completed poem after phase one. The roof is on, um, the Tudor is back. And actually, I should say the, the Tudor framing is uh, cypress wood, which we aren't allowed to harvest anymore, so we salvaged what we could, and what we couldn't, we replaced. We uh, obtained uh, material from the Frank Lloyd Wright Conservancy. Um, they had some old wine vats that had been made out of cypress, so we uh, bought that wood and had it milled and replaced the, the pieces of cypress on the exterior of the home. Um, you can also see from looking at this that the new masonry construction and the existing masonry construction uh, is relatively seamless. You, you really can't tell where the 1929 starts and the 1999 begins. Um, the next thing we actually had to do was then start to work on the interior. Now, while the, the exterior was under construction, we were continuing documentation and uh, design for the interior of the rooms. Um, one of the major components actually turned out to be the windows. Uh, this is us looking at a sample of a steel window. Uh, the original windows to the house were lead glass um, in a steel frame. And uh, it was important that we maintain the sight lines uh, for the house. There are some windows that are so narrow that it, they would be 10 inches wide. And if you had an inch frame, you only had 8 inches of glass. So it was important to uh, get something that um, was relatively close to the original. So we utilized uh, Hope Steel windows and uh, to, to create um, or to reconstruct 
the 185 steel windows that were originally in the house. And uh, Mr. Valacorso wanted leaded glass window, but he also wanted insulated glazing, which um, the two don't really work together. It's the nature of leaded glass to um, deteriorate through time, and, and it would then break a seal if you use one pane of leaded glass as part of an insulated glazed unit. So what we did was um, uh, incorporated um, insulated units that had a central or a third pane of glass that was actually where the leaded glass was located. So what you see on the outside is a, a pane of glass, a center pane of leaded glass, and then the inside again is another sheet of glass. And this allowed us to provide an insulated glazed unit in a um, steel frame and mimic uh, the patterns of the original windows. Another detail that was unique to the house on the interior of the home was uh, roll screens. And again, the, um, the design and detail for the main part of the house was at a higher quality, if you will, than the servants' quarters. So in the main part of the house, they had these roll screens that uh, would actually be located behind the wood trim. And um, we found a manufacturer in California that made uh, roll screens that had a similar proportion. So uh, the left side of this window actually has the roll screen uh, in the up position. Um, so you can tell when that window is closed and the roll screen is tucked away up behind the wood trim that it's not really visible. Um, on the right side of that window, there's a roll screen that I stopped short. Um, I didn't bring all the way down to the sill um, primarily because it was difficult to even see in a photograph if I had brought it all the way down. So um, it's, a, it's a very clean detail, um, but it allows you to um, open the windows and have a screen, and then when the windows are closed, to let the screen go away. On the servant's side of the house, however, they didn't have the roll screens. Um, they were incorporated hinged screens, and um, so this is a series of windows where you can see uh, one hinge screen in an open position to help you see it, and then the two windows on the right side uh, have the hinge screen in a closed position. So uh, even though this is what's the servant side of the house is actually a, a very nice detail. And in the basement, um, the windows located in the basement all look out at concrete walls because they're looking out at window wells. And um, so the glazing that they used in the basement windows uh, was colored and or textured so that you didn't really see a concrete wall, that you, you allowed light to come in without having to look at the, um, at the window well itself. And so we replicated even down to the, the pattern of, um, of uh, the two shades of uh, colored glazing in these windows. Uh, earlier on I said we had salvaged a piece of the crown in the living room, so the plaster work became um, a very large contract. All the walls and ceilings of this home are plaster. Several of the rooms have plaster crowns and um, plaster detailing. And what you see here is the mold that was made from that three-foot section that we had salvaged from the living room. And this, this is set up on site. This is actually inside the kitchen. They, they used it to um, make their crown molding on site and then just transport them into the room where they were to be installed. And that is a gentleman installing uh, our replication, our uh, reproduction of the crown mold in the living room. Uh, we also incorporated some new designs. Um, one of the upgrades Mr. Bell, of course, requested was to add air conditioning to the home. Um, which, of course, with the, the selected system, that ceiling diffusers. So in, to incorporate them a little bit more eloquently into the design, uh, obviously not a 1929 design, um, uh, was to do a very simple diffuser. And then we uh, did a little additional uh, plaster work around them in order to make them feel as if they fit a little bit more into the home. So the ceiling that you're looking at here is actually the dining room ceiling. Uh, there'll be a light fixture uh, at that center medallion and then the, the two square 
pieces on either side are, are actually diffusers for the air conditioning system. Again, we had salvaged hardware throughout the house and, and replicated what was used. This was the hinge that was used on the second floor. There was a different hinge per floor um, and then also a different hinge between uh, servants side in the main portion of the house per floor. Uh, we okay. Ready? Ready. These next series of slides are all going to be during the construction of the interior of the home. What you see here is a partially finished bedroom on the second floor. Um, one of the things to notice in this particular, well, actually throughout the house, is uh, we had changed from the original heating system, which is a radiator system, to a radiant floor heating system. So the way the house is heated today is through um, uh, hot water that's in a series of tubes that are actually underneath this floor and are not seen um, in any shape, way, or form, but just generally heat the floor and then in turn heat the room. Uh, the radiator system would have involved a radiator at this window. It would have been exposed. Um, we did a cost analysis in the beginning of the project and determined that the radiator or the radiant floor heating was actually cheaper than the radiant or the radiator. I'm going to say that we did a cost analysis at the beginning of the project and determined that the radiant floor heating system was less costly than the original radiator heat system. Um, as all owners, Mr. Valcourse wanted to um, have his uh, final touches in the house. So one of the uh, items that are generally new and, and didn't really replicate any era or any previous era is the tile selection. And this particular tile um, is in the entry vestibule of the home. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that there were seven fireplaces, six of which needed to be completely redone with fireplace surround um, in order to uh, get a quality of uh, fireplace surround equal to what was done in 1949, uh, we had mock-ups done. What you're looking at here is a mock-up of the mantle for the fireplace that would be put in the living room. And this is a mock-up carv carving for the uh, floral portion of that fireplace. Again, this is in the living room, and this is just simply a sample to know that the uh, people who would be producing the surrounds were providing us with the quality that we wanted. Um, these are hand carved in Italy. And that is the living room fireplace installed. And a detail of that marble in place. So you see the marble mantle, um, the floral design. Uh, originally those two pieces were in wood and then in this current state they're uh, carved marble. Uh, the millwork contract within this home was $1.2 million, and um, so these carpenters uh, were working everywhere in their shop, in a, in a finisher shop, and then when they bring things out into the field, they would scribe and cut to fit, uh, so things fit in a custom way. So they actually use the living room in our finished state. You see the plaster beams are in place. They finished the wood trim on the windows. Um, but they basically have set up shop in the living room in order to complete wood trim detail in the remainder of the house. Uh, the dining room <coughs> fireplace um, has been installed at this point. Um, again, we had no recollection or, or no uh, pieces to work from. This was done purely from uh, photographs, and that's a detail of the dining room fireplace. Uh, this is the morning room fireplace with wood trim in place. The wood trim, uh, if you remember the, the photograph of the blue room, that was the morning room when the Struggle family uh, lived in the home. And Mr. Valacorso opted not to have painted wood in this room but uh, stained cherry. The white walls at this point are, are plaster walls, they're not painted yet. And the floor is a stone tile with a uh, little fish and frogs and inset into it. So he was having a little fun in the 
floor tile of this room as well. Now this is the main hall. Uh, we saw a photograph again from the Stobel family. We've got the columns in place. Um, and again, the carpenters are setting up shop to actually fit. Uh, yeah. Uh, Carpenters have again set up shop in the, the hall in order to um, scribe and cut wood pieces to fit uh, in the house. But the main hall at this point you can see has uh, the crown uh, in place but not complete yet. Um, the embedded columns on either side of the doorway. The wood framing and casing around the doors that lead to the dining room. The wood carvings aren't yet in place. This is a view of the main corridor from one end of the hall. Of the window that you see at the far end is the stone bay window in the living room. And um, this door frame was added in 1949, a painted door frame on either side. You can see the depth is, is uh, uh, like two or three feet deep. And that uh, is where those pocket doors are located. When the doors are in the open position, uh, or what they do is close off the other section of the hallway. They're actually able to put the open these doors to uh, seal off the remainder of that corridor. Uh, these doors are um, in place only for fitting. The, they obviously need to have the panels located. They will be ultimately solid raised panel doors. And a side view of that pocket detail. You have that same door frame, and then the uh, the the corridor door is, is set back in its pocket. And to provide you an understanding of, of uh, again, Mr. Vallow, of course, his taste, the wood now um, throughout the house in terms of trim is cherry and it's typically stained. Um, the doors you see, the wood profiles you see, though, however, are all original to the house. We were able to take profiles from pieces that were salvaged and, and recreate them. Uh, this room is called the Flower Room uh, in the 1929 specification. Um, again, we were able to recreate cabinetry, uh, a sink, countertops. Uh, the tile is a, a, the terracotta, it's repeated in a kitchen and the pantry. Um, the, the earth tones. Uh, to, to give that quality and a consistency to the home in terms of uh, materials and design. This is the pantry. Um, we had a little uh, flexibility with including more modern utilities. So uh, what you see are a couple food warmers that were included. The pantry room also has a dishwasher, a sink, a trash compactor, a refrigerator. Um, and there's also a dumbwaiter that connects the three floors um, and the dumbwaiter opens out into this, this pantry room. Uh, another upgrade that uh, Mr. Velocorsa requested was to switch from the porcelain uh, pedestal sinks. This is a marble pedestal sink with um, uh, gilded or gold. Uh, Please stop just for a second. Sure. Sorry. I'm not getting a focus on this. So we just start whatever you're going to say. Um, this is a photograph in the of a upstairs bathroom um, during construction. The uh, medicine cabinet isn't just in yet, um, but it does describe some of the materials that are now in place. Um, all new tile selections were made, and the uh, one of the major uh, upgrades that Mr. Bell, of course, requested was uh, marble pedestal sinks in lieu of um, porcelain. So what you see here is a pedestal sink that had been carved out of a a single block of marble. And this is a photograph of the servant's bathroom, which um, uh, of course is supposed to have a downgrading quality uh, according to the 1929 design. And um, so his view, Mr. Fowler, of course, view of that was, uh, okay, now we have a, a porcelain pedestal sink, but it has a hand-painted design on the sides and in the faucets and the uh, towel racks and the Toilet tissue dispensers are all matched and are hand painted porcelain. And even in the boiler room, remember this was the room that was in three feet of water when we arrived. This has all been drained out, and a new terrazzo floor has been installed throughout the basement, including the boiler room. 
So again, if we, if we remind ourselves, this was our before picture of the laundry in the basement. We have uh, we all sorts of pipe work in the ceiling, um, vertical pipes going every which way when they added electrical. And this is the finished laundry room today. Uh, we were able to conceal most of the pipes. Um, and we still had some exposed pipes. It's a very low ceiling in the basement, but we were able to conceal most. And I put in a new counter, a granite countertop, a new basement windows, terrazzo floor. Again, this was the library, or what was, was the library when we uh, started working on the house. And this is the finished library of that same corner. And another view of the library and how the millwork incorporates into the wood trim of the windows. This is a photograph of the living room bay window. That's a stone bay window with a plaster wall adjacent to it. And this is that same bay window today. So the stone windows were reconstructed. Um, we have a new wood floor, wood base, plaster walls. Exterior walls are now insulated. Um, that was not uh, incorporated in the original design of the home. Uh, the plaster crown is in place and we refurbished um, some fine light fixtures and installed them in the home. And again, that is the, the completed uh, living room, fireplace, wood paneling, plaster crown. Again, our before picture of the main stair hall. This is what we started to work with. And this is our completed main stair. Uh, the 1929 specification talks specifically about hand carved wood on the stair. The um, detail uh, of that stair tread uh, transition is all hand carved wood. The chandelier is a refurbished chandelier out of a shop from Chicago. That's a detail of the uh, mahogany treads in the hand carved wood. Is there before picture of the master bedroom? And our after picture showing the wood floor, the new cabinets, the doors. And again, this was all based actually on conversation, asking someone, well, what did you see when you turned left, basically. This uh, uh, is again that photograph of the uh, wall of the master bath where we uh, measured the exact locations of wood trim that was used to uh, decorate the walls of the master bath. And that is the master bathroom completed today. The uh, sink is in the same location, the bath is in the same location. Um, we incorporated the air conditioning system actually in a slot that's located over the window. So you don't really see that in this arched ceiling. You don't see air conditioning units in this arched ceiling. There are some rooms that we didn't have before pictures for, and this is one of them. This is the second master bathroom. Um, Mr. Valaparsa had been renovating it. We were told that he had um, marble from floor to ceiling, so again, we had marble from floor to ceiling. We incorporated for him uh, uh, more showers. Most of the bathrooms in the original house simply had bathtubs without showers, so this is um, one of the rooms that received uh, a shower within the bathtub enclosure. So you see the shower doors to your left side. And um, another revision he requested was uh, the use of base cabinets in a few of the rooms. So this room has a, a base cabinet. Originally it had a pedestal sink. Uh, again, this is the dining room today. You saw um, the uh, photograph from the Struggle family, and so we recreated the cabinets based on those photographs. Um, the amount of the fireplace is in place. You remember the plaster work for the light fixture that would be centered over the dining room table and the diffuser. And that is the original Wayne's coat design. We, that is one piece in this room that I know is, is historically accurate.
And this is the French room completed today. Um, again, we had the one photograph because we did not have any of these walls existing in place. We had that section of flooring that we found out in the middle of the yard, so we have a, a, a pattern wood floor uh, in the French room. Uh, again, the fireplace surround was based on the 1949 sketch and uh, hand carved in Italy and shipped over. So I would be remiss to say that uh, although I was principal charge and project architect on the job that I didn't have help and um, the gentleman coming through the side of the kitchen door is um, our superintendent, our superintendent, his name is Clayton Stump. He was out here every day trying to work with the trades and make sure that uh, things went smoothly and that the quality of construction was the level that we desired. And Don Vanderwerp of our office uh, is the associate architect on staff for the project. He documented him. Um, uh, he worked on the construction documents for the home. He uh, designed portions or certain features within the home and then was out here on a regular basis to uh, make sure that the contractors were following the design intent of the drawings as, as closely as possible. And, you know, we even though a lot of the home was reconstructed, it still had an existing conditions to work with, which always um, might, may cause some problems, so he would feel those kinds of questions when uh, uh, new issues arose based on uh, existing conditions that we found that we weren't anticipating. And Tim Burkery is our construction manager, and so his responsibility included bidding out the work, uh, working with each trade, scheduling the trades, and making sure they're all coordinated. There were 46 major contracts left for this house, and um, so that wasn't a small feat to keep them all in order and, uh, and continuing to work in a regular pace and moving forward. And of course, uh, George Mason, I wouldn't want to forget that the initial design um, intent was one that was clear to me and easier to follow once uh, we got in and investigated what the thoughts were and uh, how the, the approach and the design concepts were executed. So uh, I always find myself uh, along the way working on a project saying, you know, what do you think George would do in a, in a case like this when we had no walls and we had no detail and we had to determine uh, what was consistent. So uh, I'd say that there was a large component still within the home. And this, of course, is the, is the completed project to date. So what we have is a, a home that has 1929 details, 1949 details, the aesthetics of Mr. Valforsa from 1999, and a uh, home that is complete with air conditioning, radiant floor heat, uh, six phone lines, cable, security, um, and complete. And they're uh, currently in the home, occupied, and, and loving every minute. Thank you. I want to thank Sandra Locks not only for presenting this a, uh, a second time, but you know, presenting it in the first place back in May of 1999 and for doing such a service uh, to the community of restoring and preserving uh, such an important home in the Gross Plains. Thank you very much.